Okay, well, buenos dias, and welcome to IoT World Congress. My name is Morgan Four, and I have the wonderful privilege today to stand here on behalf of the International Society of Automation in partnership with FIRA Barcelona to present to you this wonderful Congress that we have put together. We have four great tracks of content today on tech-enabled disruption, sustainability, and climate change, standards and regulations, and IoT security and cybersecurity. So we hope you like what we've got planned for today. And we're gonna start by introducing some of the folks who are behind all of this wonderful conference today. Our first guest will be Mr. Constanti Serionga, the CEO of FIRA Barcelona. Good morning, authorities, good mornings, ladies and gentlemen, bon dia a tots, buenos dies. As general manager of Fira de Barcelona, I do like to welcome, uh, to welcome of you to this eighth edition of the IoT Solutions World Congress, a key event that focuses on seizing the potential of disruptive technologies to transform our industries. As you are well aware, this is not a minor issue. How we produce and drive our economies shapes how we live and how we are. We are at an historic moment where technologies such as artificial intelligence and the Internet of Things change our world forever. Fostering, information, fostering innovation, collaboration, and the exchange of knowledge is at the very core of Fira de Barcelona's NDA. And this is why today is an important day for us. Because during these three days, we will share ideas, solutions, and ways to chart new paths to, uh, to a better uh, future. For companies, this means finding opportunities for growth and new ways to do things better, smarter, and more efficiently, but also in a responsible, sustainable, and a safer manner. This is why IoT Solutions World Congress will be held, will be held alongside with the 5th Barcelona Cybersecurity Congress, jointly organized with the Agencia de Ciberseguridad de Catalunya. In an, increasingly, in an increasingly digitized and interconnected world, the importance on safeguarding our digital infrastructures and assets is paramount. And this Congress provides a forum for expert and companies to tackle the threats and challenges of cyber attacks and to plot a course toward a more secure digital future. Together, these three days, these Congresses represent the convergence of cutting-edge technologies, visionary thinking, and a shared commitment to driving positive change. Thank you very much and welcome to the IoT Schools World Congress and the Barcelona Cybersecurity Congress. Welcome, Bemingutz. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, next, we have Zhu Zhuilang, who is the Executive Assistant for Wuji IoT Innovation Promotion Center on Information Technology Bureau. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, dear Mr. Constantine, Ms. Mark, uh, ladies and gentlemen, good morning, everyone. I'm Xu Yuliang from Wuxi, China, and it's my honor to be invited to attend this year's IoT Solution Congress. Last October, with the assistance of Euro, Europe Project Innovation Center, we invited Ms. Mark to Wuxi to attend the 2023 WIOT exposition and signed a memorandum of understanding, officially marking the beginning of the dual exhibition linkage between IOT SWC and WIOTE. The deep cooperation between us will further promotion or promote information exchange, resource sharing, and industrial integration in China and the Euro IoT ecosystem creating more possibilities for international cooperation in the field of the IoT. 
Wuxi is, a, is located in the geographical center of the most developed region in e eastern China. It's a famous industrial and commercial city with a long history and a developed economy. Last year, Wuxi's GDP exceeded in 1.5 trillion IMB, and its per capita GDP has been ranked first among large and medium-sized cities in China for many years. Wuxi people's business gene and innovation spirit are deeply rooted. For the IoT industry, we officially promoted it uh, since 2009. At present, there are more than 3,500 enterprises in the city. A large number of achievements have been accumulated in the core area, such as sensors, industrial internet, internet of vehicles, and smart cities. Since 2010, we held IoT exposition. Every year in, and in 2016, we officially renamed it to the World IoT Exposition. For now, it has become a well-known event in the IoT industry in China and even the world. It has built a cooperation platform for IoT industry professionals to discuss technology, products, solutions, and the development opportunities. This year's WIOT will be held in late October. We warmly welcome Mr. Constantine, Mr. Mark, and all the present today to go to Wuxi to participate in 2024 WIOTE. And you can inspect Wuxi's investment environment and search for some business opportunity. We hope that WIOTE and the IOT SWC will establish a closer co cooperative relationship. And we can jointly promote the development of the IOT industry. Finally, I wish the 2024 IOT, uh, IOT SWC a complete success and wish all the friends present a smooth journey. Thank you. Gracias. Fantastic. Thank you so much for that message. Uh, next, we have Mr. Mark Rialp, who is the Secretary of Telecommunications and the Digital Transformation General Attat of Catalonia. Welcome to the stage. Hello. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for being here today. Welcome to Barcelona, welcome to Catalonia. Welcome to what we all know as the mobile world capital and welcome what we want to be, what we want, what we expect to be as the cyber security uh, world capital. We are at the verge of a three-day Barcelona Cybersecurity Congress, an event uh, that we are promoting from the Catalan Cybersecurity Agency together with Feria de Barcelona with the aim of debating, sharing, defining, and designing the guidelines for the future of the cybersecurity sector, which is very much alive. The Catalan government is not a government that just lets things happen, but one that wants to make things happen. We want to be, as we are, key players in the challenges that society is facing nowadays. And of course, cybersecurity is one of them. The, government, uh, the Catalan government is committed to cybersecurity and its, its commitment is clear with the Catalan Cybersecurity Agency playing a key role. Let me share some figures with you in order to understand the role of the Cybersecurity Agency. We are a country of 8 million citizens and during 2023, our agency has dealt with 4,000 million cyber attacks to public administrations. And of these attacks, around 2,000 became security incidents managed by the Cyber Security, cyber security Agency. And we expect these figures to increase exponentially in the coming years. 
For this reason, from the Catalan government, we have increased our strategic commitment to cybersecurity with an unprecedented public investment of 230 million euros for the coming four years. To deploy and increase the level of protection, prevention, resilience, and incident response, as well as to train and raise awareness of cybersecurity in the public spheres of Catalonia. To make it clear, in four years, we will match the investment that, at the current rate, would have taken us 10 years to reach. But let me remark an essential aspect of the investment and this strategic commitment to cybersecurity that we have as a government. And this is innovation. Innovation is about thinking of tomorrow. Innovation is the way that enables us to follow the path of digitalization, which is advancing at a frenetic pace. We must introduce innovation at the core of all our institutions. And this is especially true when talking about innovation in cybersecurity. And this is why this year's motto of the Congress is so important. Secure today, save world tomorrow. But we have to do it all of us together, the companies, the experts, the cybersecurity professionals, the institutions, everyone. And this Congress is the place to do it, to exchange experiences, to position best practices, to present cutting edge solutions. It is a meeting point to think about solutions to the problems of tomorrow. Uh, we expect, we have 72 expositors and we expect around 12,000 visitors this year in the cybersecurity Congress. Therefore, this is not the beginning of just another Congress. We are on the threshold of a Congress that has to become a community, a joint project that will help us to achieve our objectives. Today, our finger is pointing to a more cyber secure horizon. And this Congress that we are presenting is a vehicle to reach this horizon. We want and encourage all of you to be part of this journey. Thank you very much, and I hope you enjoy the Congress the city and the country. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. What a powerful message. Secure today, save work tomorrow. Uh, that's what we're talking about today, and I appreciate you reiterating that, Mark. Uh, and now it is my pleasure to introduce to you our keynote speaker today, who is all the way from New York City, Mr. Shoa Roshini. Shoa Roshini. I'm sorry. I'm just oh, saying your name wrong. Sharul. Shahini, partner, McKinsey & Company. Thank you so much. <laughs> so sorry about that. Good morning, everyone, and uh, thank, you, uh, thank you for having me. So as Morgan mentioned, uh, I'm Rahul Shahani. I'm a partner with McKinsey, and I help run our North America Industry 4.0 practice. Uh, what, we've, uh, what we've been seeing over the last few years is being exploring what does industry 4.0 look like, what does industrial IoT look like, and how do you drive value from digitization? And so I want to share with you a little bit today about what we've seen as factories, supply chains, doing to drive value from digitalization and to end IoT solutions, and how that translates into uh, some of the trends that we're seeing in, in, the, in the marketplace. So. Slides here. There we go. So when we think about uh, the traditional world of manufacturing or operations, uh, we're currently in what we call the fourth industrial revolution or industry 4.0. And the idea behind this is to say that we, when we started this journey out, we said, what does value look like? What does impact look like? And what is going to drive transformational change in this, in this space? And there really were no good examples. Right? If you think back to the, the operations world, uh, lean manufacturing was kind of the revolution we were coming off of, and it was very easy to see what good looked like. And when we, we saw that it was always, you always ask somebody, what does good lean lean look like? And it was just Toyota. Right? That was, it started off as Toyota over the years, you added other examples like Danaher and many other companies, but it was always clear to say, I know what good looks like. But in the world of digitalization, it's not clear what good looks like. And when we, five years ago, we were looking out and saying, what does, what does really strong, great examples of digitalization in the factory, in the supply chain, really look like? And 
we came up with, with like no clean single point answer. So we said, let's go create one. And that's when we partnered with the World Economic Forum to say, let's go and look at what are the factories in the world and what are they doing great? And what do the best factories look like that will tell us that uh, this is what we should all collectively aspire to? So we did a scan and we looked at about 12,000 factories around the world. Over the last five years, over 1,200 factories have then said, I've applied and said I want to be considered as like a leading lighthouse factory. And we started with today, we have 153 lighthouses that demonstrate what does great in digitalization look like. When we started this five years ago, it was 18. In five years, we've seen it ramp up by about 10x. And I'm hoping over the next five years, we continue to see this ramp up by 10x. But what does it mean to be a lighthouse, right? This is a designation that uh, we've identified and recognized, but what does it mean? Right? What, do, what do these 153 lighthouses contribute? And so what we started off was a simple definition to say the purpose of a lighthouse is to be a demonstration of what great looks like. But in the world of how do you define great, we said great is on four very simple things. It's fundamentally impact achieved. Because at the end of the day, transformational change will only happen when you can take value and say this value is translating into the bottom line of the business. Because that's how you get the next set of investments and you're able to drive the, um, the change that is needed at, and get that buy-in from the organization. So we said the most important thing you need to have to be successful in a digitalization is money, is value, impact. The next is to say that having impact is not enough, right? It's the impact has to be driven, has to be supported by a step change or in a, in a new way of working. We call this integrated use cases, this a series of solutions that work together to change how you were working, how you were operating. The next we say there's enablers behind this around capabilities and people and, and data that allow you to go and work differently. And lastly, it's about technology platforms that support and underpin this. And the intent behind this is that if an organization or a factory or supply chain has all four of these capabilities, that right, means value delivered, fundamental new way of working, the capabilities to drive and sustain this, and the technology that underpins this, you're able to say that I am working in a new world, of, in a new way that is fundamentally different than the way I was working four or five years ago, and digital, and techno digital technology is at the center of that. And I also have the capability to say that I will not regress behind this. I have not done a one-time investment upskilled myself and regressed. Now, with that, we said, so we set off and said, this is how we're gonna define great. And now we, find, we went out and found 153 lighthouses and that, that emulate great and, and give us an opportunity, a platform to say, well, let's learn from this and say, what, are, what can we take away from this that would be relevant and exciting to other organizations as they go through their own journeys and undertake their own digital transformations? So, one of the outcomes coming out of this was this slide. This slide is a slide that only a consultant can love, and I love this slide. And what it basically says is every dot you see there is a factory. And it's a factory that has proven to have this value and this impact independently verified. Right? And what, what I wanted you to take away from this right, is to say that through digitalization, through, the, uh, through a digital transformation journey, any type of impact is possible. Right? It's, you, can, you can go out and unlock volume. You can, unlock, you can reduce cost. You can improve quality. You can drive employee engagement and employee satisfaction. The key, to, the key part to understand is to say, what is most important to the business? Right? In today's world, a lot of us are seeing in, in our operations challenges with talent, right? challenges with retention, challenges with engagement. If, the, if that's the number one burning platform the business needs to solve, Right, because you're getting into a, a shift in generational workforces. Right? Employee engagement becomes a very ripe capability in harness, and there's a number of solutions and use cases that can be deployed to go and tackle that. Similarly, as we've tried to be solved for resiliency over the last few years, as we've had unnamed, like, un unknown number of supply chain disruptions, many organizations went and said, I want to go and unlock agility. I need to reduce the, si the, the cycle times. I need to reduce the size of my batch. And I need to be able to go from order to delivery much faster. And what we've, saw, what we've seen is that businesses over the last five years have adapted to the value that's needed for themselves. In the middle of the pandemic, what was most important to many organizations was I need to be able to suddenly ramp up supply or suddenly reduce costs, depending on the industry you were sitting in. And so we saw value come in from there. 
What, what this tells me is that with the right set of solutions, you can really unlock any set of value, and the ranges on the far right tell you that depending, if you get the problem and, and value right, it's transformative, right? You're looking at a 100, 200% increase in many of these cases. And so the, so the key here is to say, what is the problem that's gonna be most valuable for the business? And now how do I then go and tackle that? Because the right solution deployed and the right series of solutions deployed can really disrupt the way you're operating. So let's, go, let's talk a little bit about what do we see the solutions look like. And it's rare to say that a single solution transforms the business. Inherently what we see is three to four different set of solutions that come together to change the way you're working. Even a simple solution like I need to do a one-click, one-touch changeover, right, which is something that happens when you're switching between products in a production system, happens all the time. Factories do it several times a day. But the, what it takes to be able to, to make that happen on, in a factory, in an environment, and drive the value, because remember, the goal of what we look for is impact achieved, right? Because a single solution that doesn't deliver impact does not get the call to say, let's go to the next factory, and the next factory, and the factory after that. It's always saying that what's the ecosystem of four, of four to five things that need to happen, from my MES to my ERP, to the endpoints that my operators are connecting to, to the orchestration layer, to the AI that's driving the decisioning, how do I really bring all of that together? And what is the ecosystem of players that's required to make that happen, right? How many of those need to be provided by the lighthouse, by the factory, by the, comp by the customer? And how many of those is provided by a technology provider, by a solution provider and vendor, and how do they come together? Because it's rare to say that this one solution will drive this value. Because what we see is that you might drive value in the factory, but does that value really flow through to the end customer, to the bottom line of the business? Because that, that's what you will drive the unlock in the capital and future investments. What we have also seen is that this value is everywhere in the operation. It's not limited to the shop floor. We see that, that as we've gone through and done this analysis, over 150 factories, we see that there's a lot of value comes in from quality, right? From improved vision systems, improved checks, uh, AI driving better, uh, better performance of, uh, of production on lines. Similarly, uh, planning is another huge value driver, right? To say, if I can auto-sense how much, how much equipment I have, what is, the, what, what is the inventory I'm sitting in my warehouses, what, what does my current state of production look like, what is the speed of production, and do, driving integrated planning from that, that's the second largest driver of value in ROI, right? But both these solutions take a little longer to implement. Additionally, procurement is, is, is another set of solutions that we see drive rapid value capture, and much faster to implement. But there's also a lot of other solutions around logistics, uh, operational productivity, and so on. M my point on this being is, there's no sh it's not that there's any domain is locked out from when it comes to driving value. Right? The value exists across the end-to-end -end of the supply chain. But what it sometimes does take is to say that you can't solve one part of the business to go get the value. You need to think about how do I fit into the ecosystem of the full value chain, and where, and how does the, and where does the value really come from across that whole, pla that whole platform? So I'll bring, an bring this to life with an example. Okay. A few years ago, uh, we recognized uh, J&J Vision Care as a lighthouse. Right? And one of the things that they did was they looked at the information flow and the product flow and said, what does this look like end to end? right from when I receive the demand signal to when I ship a product out to get it to the customer, right? In this case, you're looking at contact lenses and in the vision care business, right from when I sense that I'm going to be driving demand to when I get the customer. What are the eight, 10 use cases that I need to completely transform that domain? Because that's the way the business was thinking, right? The, for them, for the business, it was to say, that will be how I will drive a step change in performance, right? It's how I'm going to drive in 40% conversion in the business, right? It's how do I drive like much faster cycle time, much faster lead time, and change the way that the, uh, the static levels, the norms, the averages of the business used to operate. And so what they went in and did, and they deployed a series of solutions, everything from uh, from demand sensing and, and consumer facing solutions all the way down to robotics and AGVs in the factory, right? As they thought about this whole thing as a 
full sequence. It was make sure that, that the value that was in being unlocked by individual solutions, individual providers, tied into driving to the business and became a platform for scaling up and, and replicating this over and over again across multiple other value chains. All right, perfect. my clicker working. Now, in, and right now where we're at right, is we're in a situation where we're seeing three, three major shifts happen in the last couple of years that have put AI front and center. I think uh, all of us here have heard the hype around AI, have heard the talk about AI, and then seen the impact and value from AI, right? And it basically comes down to three key things that make why AI is becoming more and more popular and disruptive right now. It's the tumbling cost of data storage and processing, right? It's rapidly expanding availability, right? We all go into environments where there's now a lot more data, much more easily available and accessible than it has been. And with new mathematics and algorithms, the accessibility and the on-ramped AI, the cost of building incremental AI solutions has never been lower, cheaper, or more accessible. Right? When we looked at this in the lighthouses, we see the same thing. When we started with our first set of lighthouses that we went and identified, which was 18 lighthouses back in September 2018, we saw that only 14% of the use cases or solutions deployed by these factories was driven by AI. As we fast forward over to the most recent cohort we had, which was December 2023, 58%, so almost three to four times more, were driven by AI. And I think this shift basically says that now the true way to drive value in a business or drive value in a factory or drive value in one of these environments has to be something at the core is powered by AI. And, th that was the, and that's a pretty meaningful shift because we says we've moved away from connection and visualization to now the state of like connection, visualization, decisioning, and pushing that decisioning to the next level so that we're able to drive insight-based action. And this is not just unique to one aspect of the factory, right? So, like I said, this, the, we, we see this time and time again as happening across the full value chain, right? Everything from supply chain planning to supply chain management, production scheduling, is process optimization, which is a little bit where we're much more familiar, to shop floor asset management, quality assembly, and so on. Every aspect of this has, we've seen, stepped in in performance, right? 10 to 20% inventory reduction, right? 10 to 20% reduction increase in on time in full deliver and delivered product, right? Which to me translates into cash paid back to the business, right? 30 to 40% increase in first pass yield. This is all impact at a level that is, that we're seeing deploy and that transforms your business. Like when you're driving 20% better uh, on time in full, you're basically driving a completely new rhythm in your business, right? And what we've seen is that an AI has really been at the center of all of these, right? You, as you see some of the examples, you're seeing that, uh, and these are some pretty big, uh, big common popular names, right? You see Unilever out there, which driving automated in inventory solutions, right? Uh, you're, see, you're seeing Hire out there with an algorithm for final assembly and work instructions to be able to say how efficiently am I operating, how efficiently am I building solutions, uh, uh, like how efficient my operator is working, and how do I continuously improve that, right? You're, it, this is really saying that with, with the power of AI and you take what you've already done with connectivity and elevate it to the next horizon. Right? A few five key observations that came out in the current state of, of AI and manufacturing, right? The use cases are everywhere, right? They're across the full value chain, right? What we're seeing though now is many organizations undertaking this, uh, this journey of assetization, which is how do I build solutions that are replicable across factory to factory to factory or value chain to value chain across the globe. And that comes in in three flavors because it's not, there's the element of technology. How do I make sure I'm writing technology? How do I create assetized models, assetized data pipelines that I can replicate when I drop them in a new environment? There's also parts of this to say, how do I redesign processes with the variability that they can adopt to locals, local ways of working. Because we all know that factories operate differently, like a factory in Europe works different factory in China versus works different factory in the US. So how do I change not just the, the 
not just the technology, but also the processes, and also the way I train, because people in individual geographies learn and engage with information differently. So we, what we're seeing is this construct of assetization, which is saying, how do I transform the way people engage with information, the way the process works, and then the way the technology works on the shop floor? And, and what you're seeing in this is that many of these companies are driving like, new ways of doing that. Right? Agilent, in this example, says they built a, they built a toolkit for, uh, for, uh, for computer vision. Right? But not only was, did that connect the, the technology, the connectors, and the plugins, they also had SOPs to say, how would I deploy this? How, does a, uh, how do you deploy this in a, in, a high, in a high volume, high labor environment versus how do you deploy this in a high volume, automated environment? And that was a big part of like, how do they drive value and change from, uh, from these solutions. Because it's the build once, deploy everywhere is what we want to aspire to, what we want to see, and what will drive scale in this industry. But there's, the, uh, there's, a, there's a heavy complexity that comes with that, which is about how do you scale and how do you make sure this works in very different settings that, are, that exist around the world. What we're also seeing is the next one is command centers. Right? is we've, d we've built a lot of control towers over the years that say, like, let me get a sense of what is happening in my supply chain, what's happening in my industry, or what's happening across my factory, across my value chain. Now we're seeing AI coming in and saying, how do I get to go from information visibility to, information to insight visibility? How do I look at what's happening in one factory and say, this is what it's going to mean for you downstream? If I have a delay, what does that mean to my downstream supplies? Right? Many organizations are experimenting with Gen AI, and Gen AI is starting to go from the shop floor and into planning, into, in, into inventory systems. And it's, it's, but it's also, what we're seeing with Gen AI is, is it's really early days, right? It's starting off as a set of solutions around co-pilots, around uh, information accessibility. And we're seeing this as coming to play in the form of uh, breaking down tribal knowledge. So many times you go into factories and they say, like the person who knows this has been working here for 30 years, they know all this information, it's all in their head. What we're seeing with Gen AI doing is that you can now go in and scan through emails, scan through maintenance logs, reports, like 20, 30 years of information that has already been sitting there. In many ways, emails have been digitized and sitting in banks. How do I pull that in and now basically make uh, tribal knowledge much more accessible because it's sitting, all the knowledge sits in, in this construct of repair logs, maintenance, uh, maintenance manuals, and so on. So we're seeing Gen AI come into the play as it, it kind of like breaks down this barrier of a previously unsolvable problem, which was I cannot crack, uh, I cannot crack tribal knowledge. And the last thing we're seeing is that with Gen AI, we're seeing pilots have, are starting with pilots, but they're going really fast. When we saw the first set of AI use cases come in, we were seeing people deploy them in about eight months. With Gen AI in the last year, we've seen people deploy pilots as quick as like six weeks. We've seen as quick as like two weeks to go from an idea to something that's running on the floor. Is it working well? Absolutely not. But in six weeks, it's driving value. In 12 weeks, it's a very stable way of working in the factory. So that speed of deployment and speed of adoption we're seeing is something that has been far faster than what we've seen with, pri with prior iterations of technology or prior technology tools. Right? And part of that's driven by what we've, we, as we make this shift, right, we've seen analytical AI, we've seen things around that have been solving, I would say, like finite problems around forecasting sales, right, uh, uh, setting optimal set points. To now we're getting a generative AI, which is opening up a new solution space, right? It's opening up a completely new space of how to solve problems. And like this problem of tribal knowledge, it's going into the area where it's saying, here's problems that I completely thought were just things I could never figure out before. Never, I, they were the problems that I thought were unsolvable that have suddenly become, come in, and suddenly is a, is a strong term, but have now come into the solution space and much, become much more accessible for organizations as you partner with lar large language models. Here's, uh, what we see here are, again, same construct, right? We, when we looked at generative AI, we're seeing pilots of generative AI solutions across the full value chain, right? Everything from, uh, fr from planning to production to, sch to scheduling uh, to, uh, to assembly, set point optimization, and, and similarly. Right? Every, what we're seeing with generative AI doing right now, it's about uh, writing code. So an example of this is uh, I was at a factory recently where one of the challenges they had was that they were running CNC machines that were using a very old form of code. 
And they said, how do I, can I, can I instead of getting the technician, who I'm paying $1,000 a day to come in and update my CNC code, can I get generative AI to write this? And they were able to write that quickly. Now, they were able to then get somebody to come in and verify and test, because they wanted to make sure they did that before running it on their machines. But it's speeding up these cycles of development that they've seen. There's one theme I'm kind of hitting on here, right? It's to say that time and time again, we're seeing AI solutions uh, and come across the entire value chain, right? It's, there's no shortage of use cases, ways to solve the problem. The real nexus here to say, how do I identify the right problem to solve? And how do I make sure it's being done in the way that the business can drive value from it? Because that will become the nexus in how do you make sure you drive that step change in performance and get the funding for the next two, three, four factories that need to go and get deployed. Right? A little bit here on some examples of what we're seeing with Gen AI when it, when it comes to, to in the factories, right? We're seeing CATL that basically it was using it as a training tool, right? To help upskill their engineers in the battery space. Now, battery is a highly specialized space. They're using Gen AI as a training mechanism to help upskill and take all this knowledge and help their engineers say, okay, how do I better access this information? So I'm designing processes, designing products much faster and uh, using this latest cutting edge knowledge that otherwise might be impossible to access. And then Schneider, we're using this to generate FMEA analyses in their factories, right? To say that writing this long form documentation that otherwise takes a quality engineer or a, or, or a production engineer a, a significant amount of time to spend hours at, at, at times to prepare documentation, can I help them write the bullet points in an hour and then create the draft? And now they spend the time proofreading it, right? Shifting the value to basically driving to knowledge, to like knowledge and insight rather than information prep. And then uh, this is another example. We talked about ACG capsules earlier, right? What we're seeing there for them, this is a maintenance co-pilot. So in three weeks, they were able to build a model, deploy it on the shop floor, and start us assisting and supporting their, op their teams and in, in doing maintenance, troubleshooting, and problem solving, right? 30 to 40% time reduction in MTTR, mean time to repair, right? And, but what was most interesting here is the 60 to 70 percent increase in adoption by 400 people on the floor, right? In a span of about six weeks. In six weeks, they went from here's an idea to here's something that 70 percent of my factory is using and driving value from. And that's something we've never seen that uh, that level of adoption in a factory before. Like usually, it can take months to get like truly broad factory adoption and shifts in ways of working. But where we are right now is very much in the early days of scale. We've seen examples of use cases, right? But many factories, many organizations, there's 10 million factories in the world, most of them are on the left side of this chart in where we're calling in the process of learning. They're going through and saying, how do I learn about how to digitize? How do I learn about IoT solutions? How do I learn about making this happen? And we're stuck in what we've called pilot purgatory. And I'm sure you've heard this term before, but this is really where People are trying. People have got things working on the floor. I don't know how many times anybody here has walked into a room and said, like, into a factory and seen, like, oh, th what, is that, what is that thing you've got running there? It's like, well, somebody put that in. We don't know how it works. That's very much what we're seeing in the pilot purgatory, right, is the sense of capital invested but value not realized. The lighthouses are on the far right of that right now where they're seeing value realized, but they're struggling to say, how do I go from one factory to 10 let alone from 153 lighthouses to 10 million lighthouses. And that's really where we're seeing the next horizon coming, right? Is this idea of shifting from learning to doing. Because it's only after we start doing can we start optimizing and shifting to a new horizon at a macro scale, right, of productivity. So the opportunity here is far, far, is, is significant because everybody's stuck in pilot purgatory. For the few that have broken through, they found themselves stuck in the next one, which is the scaling slump. Right? And many, many organizations now are trying different ways to say, how do I get out of this? How do I go from one factory to 10? If I had, like, how do I go from my top five factories to my 300 factories in my network? Because that's the problem that is truly uncrackable right now and is where a lot of the energy and, and innovation is being spent. Right? As we looked again this, across this, and as we looked at 153 lighthouses, we said, what are they doing right? Like for the people who have gone from like one factory to eight, like Johnson & Johnson, from people who've gone from one factory to like seven, like Unilever, right? What are they doing right? What have they done that has worked? And we distilled it down to say there's six things 
that they fundamentally get right or invest in every time. The first is they have a strategic roadmap. They understand where the value comes from. Right? They say, What's matter what matters to me in this factory or in this business is increase in volume or a reduction in cost or an increase in agility. And having that view to say, this is what I know, this is what I need to go and unlock from a business perspective, helps them unlock the funding to go do it. So having that clear strategic roadmap that says, this is what I'm needing to drive, my business is aligned on it, the operations is aligned on it, and it fundamentally is driving with the strategic goals of the, of the, of the, of the organization, is the first step. Next is the talent. What is the, do I have the right skills and capabilities available to me to be able to go and deliver this value, to deliver this value, unlock this? And the talent does not have to be in-house, right? It's a talent is, in all of these, think of them as, as ecosystem of capabilities. It's talent between an organization, its, partner, its partners, vendors they work with, and everybody else, right? To say, collectively, do I have the army of talent that I need to go and make this change happen? The next is the agile operating model. And I always get in trouble when I use the word agile. But think of this as, do I have an iterative operating model that allows me to test, learn, refine? Right? Does this, do I have a way of working that allows me to say that I'm going to deploy something, test it, and, and then unlock funding as I'm able to prove the value? Because in many cases, if you do a one crunch of funding and as you deploy things, you'll get stuck in pilot purgatory. Because if, you, because if you've not been able to iterate and find the value, to problem nexus, then that solution gets forgotten, it gets left behind, and the customer never moves to the next one, right? Or never, never moves to scale. The next is the technology, right? Is do I have the right ecosystem of partners and players to say that how am I going to work differently? Technology in many ways, I, can, I always say like is, is, it would be solutions, use cases, is do I, have the, do I have the fundamental building blocks of how my work is going to work differently? And do I have the right data to be able to support that, right? And those two need to go hand in hand. And lastly, it's change management, right? I've got the right tools. I know they're going to work. I've proven that they work in a, in, in a, small, in a small pilot. But the question is now, do I have the capability to go and deploy them, get people excited about the change, get the end users engaged and are willing to pull this through and make this change in their day to day, right? You can update the SOP all you want, but if the end users are not saying that this is what I want to do, this is how I want to work, this is going to make my life fundamentally better, it becomes just another technology that gets deployed that doesn't drive the value, that doesn't get the unlock for scale up. And so what we've seen by organizations that have really gone through this is that they have really tackled all six of these and said, by, by unlocking each one systematically, we're able, to build a, we're able to build the fundamental building blocks to drive not only impact, but impact at, uh, impact at scale and impact that's sustainable. As we've done this, one of the things we realized is the way you tackle this problem for a factory is very different from the way you would tackle this problem for a network. Right? The way you would tackle what might be important for your individual factory might be to say, I need to go and unlock more capacity at this factory that makes this particular product because that's in hot demand right now. But my entire network has a mix of problems, has a mix of products, and I, that one strategy does not fit all. Right? So what we're seeing is that organizations tackle this by saying, how do I think about the right network of solutions? What do I think about the right archetypes to say, I need to have three capabilities. I need to have a throughput increase, an agility increase, or even a cost reduction mo model. Right? So we see a shift in the way you think about your roadmap from a portfolio and archetypes rather than an individual type of solution. Similarly with talent, right? And many times you're, when you think about talent, you think about it uh, from a factory perspective as, how do I have the right people? How do I have the right COE, the right IT department support, the right vendor support to be able to go and solve this problem? When we think about it at a network scale, what we're seeing organizations think about is, how do I partner with institutions? How do I partner with local governments? How do I partner with local organizations to drive a new way of cultivating and developing the talent? Right? If I need to build uh, deep expertise in GXP data management in pharmaceuticals, how do, I be, how do I partner with a local university or local college to be able to upskill my frontline workforce to be able to do that? And so that's what we're seeing as we get into the network scale is a shift that's coming in where, we're, where organizations are bringing in local government or partners, they're bringing in local university and education partners, 
and making a fundamental shift in how they are engaging on their digital transformations. Right? This, this continues in the same theme of when it comes to technology, data. It's also you, beyond just the single factor, you're now thinking about how do I partner in ecosystems with my local community or even in, across my industry to create standards for how I will connect information and drive more value and in industry at scale. You see many organizations kind of going down this road of saying, like, how do I define and set industrial standards for, uh, standards for industrial data? And that's very much coming out of what we're seeing, this shift from going from factory focus to network focus. Right? One of the key themes I want to talk about here is talent and people. Because we get this question all the time, is how many people do I need to go and transform my business? And when we looked at the 153 factories, what we saw was a few themes that came to light. That typically, Lighthouses will have about 1,000 people. For every 1,000 FTEs, or every 1,000 people there working in a, in a factory or working in a network, they have about 25 new roles who are driving the digital transformation. Interestingly, 60% of these roles are technologists, but 40% of them are people who are sitting in the business, who are sitting in operations, who are helping do things like make the business case, make the change happen, drive adoption, and drive engagement. Right, this goes back to like, the strategic roadmap and the change management side of the enablers. Right? This is, and so what we're seeing is that 60% are, are technologists who are saying, do I have the right tools, the right data, the right solutions, and can I drive them? Another really interesting insight that comes out from this is to say, I, like, we always get the question is, okay, I'm going to go hire these 25 people. Where should they sit? Should they sit in IT? Should they sit in a COE? Should they sit at the factory? And what we've seen, it really doesn't matter. As long as they're working towards the common goal, they're assigned towards the objective of the business, and there's true top-down alignment of saying what we need is this, uh, this capability, the business rallies around that. And then organizational barriers tend to become almost mo moot in this, ex in this exercise. Because we've seen lighthouses where these teams sit across in every combination, and that's never hindered an organization that says, this is what I need to go solve from going and solving the problem. Right, so what we always say is that it doesn't matter where people sit, it's much more important to have the resources and have top-down alignment and saying, this is what I want to go and unlock, and this is the value I need to create. Because that will, that will be what will energize and drive the, the, that prioritization across the board. A couple of examples here on how we're seeing organizations drive upskilling. Right? Siemens, for example, what they did was they looked at every role in their factory. And he said, what do these people, what do these, what do these operators, what do these individuals need to know? So they have everything from like an assembler. They said they need to know the fundamentals of troubleshooting of a digital solution on the floor, which meant that, hey, I need to know I should call this person or I need to be able to restart this machine if this, something goes down. They also said I need to understand the fundamentals of cybersecurity, right? To say that don't, act, don't plug in a USB stick on the shop floor if you don't know where it came from, right? So that was saying that how do I go and say, for every role in the factory, what is the skill set that's relevant to them, and how do, they, how do I upskill them by knowing that capability? And another example here is HP. In Singapore, at their factory there, they said, I've got people who've been working across the entire factory with different roles. If I go to my operators and I invest in, uh, in using digital tools, solutions to automate 20% of their task away, can I have them start doing more maintenance work? Can I have them spend more time fixing the machines, inspecting the machines, and free up my, my technicians. Now can I have my technicians, my maintenance techs, work on more value-added activities that my engineers would be doing, right? Can they do simple solution reviews? Can they do some simple solution designs? I might still have an engineer sign off on the final docu product, but now I'm, am I pulling my maintenance team in to be able to create my solutions? And now with my engineers, can I go and help them learn how to code? Can I help them learn the new sets of how to build a digital twin, how to engage in new ways of working and new solutions that they did not have time for before? And that was something that we've seen was very, very successful, is as you think about what does the transformation of all your roles look like, because that transforms into saying that everybody's working differently. But this is not a, a problem that, the, that an individual needs to solve on their own, right? Many of these organizations that went down this road they partnered with their vendors. They partnered with their solution providers. They partnered with local universities. Because it's all about, like, it's when you're shifting the role, a lot of this comes into that change management, and this comes into capability building that comes from the ecosystem of partners around you who are invested in changing the way the factory operates. Right? So as, as many in this, in, this, in, this, in this room are thinking about, like, how do I partner with my customers in making this change? Think about how am I partnering not just on technology, but also on 
upskilling and changing the way the individuals are working in shifting the workforce. Because that's really the key to drives unlock and at the end of the, like adoption unlock and at the end of the day value capture. What I'd say is that what we're seeing across the board, right, is basically people falling into four archetypes. There's organizations that are the innovators, the traditional disruptors, right? They make outsized investments to say, I'm going to go out and deploy disproportionate investment and make a big bet. If I win this bet, I will lead the industry, I will disrupt the way I work and make a, make, a, make a step change in how this happens. We see this come into many, many chemical industries, for example, where they invest heavily in process science and, and uh, investing in capabilities around digital twins on their process that transforms how they make a product to the product, and it helps them win that market on price. We then see accelerators. Accelerators are what I would call most of our lighthouses, is they're saying, I see value in this. I'm not going to make disproportionate risky bets but I'm going to deploy solutions, partner with, my, with, with a, an ecosystem of players to say, how do I create something that's unique to my business far before it's widely adopted? This is where a lot of the exciting innovation happens in the, in the term, and this is where, the one, where many of the organizations are actually investing more than, what, uh, th than, than the average in the marketplace. Then you end up with the fast followers. Here's where, here's most, this is where most organizations fall. This is where, if you remember that chart, this is where everybody on the left side in pilot purgatory sits for the most part. And this is where organizations are, where they're saying, I'll partner with the vendor, I'll partner with the solution provider, we'll do a small pilot, we'll see if it works, and if everything works perfectly, I will deploy it and scale. So they're waiting for the, for, for the industry to get to a level of maturity where the problems are solved for them. They're looking to their provide, the solution providers, they're looking to partners to say, I need you to take the risk. I need you to solve the problem, and then I will scale. So as technology and capabilities mature, that group will slowly move to the left and slowly rise up. And, that, and, and that's where you will drive a lot more adoption. Right? And lastly, you have the laggards. The laggards are the ones who have said, look, I don't have the time for this right now. This is not a priority for my business. It doesn't mean they get left behind. It means that for them to catch up, it, it's going to require disproportionate level of investment relative to value. Right? If, you, if we think about that, that over a five-year horizon, an average solution drives 8 to 9x ROI or return on, on return, uh, in, in cumulative return, for a laggard, it might drive 2 to 3x, and you may not make money for the first two years of deploying something because you're, you've got significant gaps in the, tech, in the underlying technology platforms, the capabilities. In many cases, they're still in, in this thing looking at saying, do I get onto the cloud or not? And so the idea behind this is as you think about how do I engage with different, uh, with different, with different customers as they look at the different solutions they've got, they're, they're going down the road on, a part is like recognize, say, where are they sitting? And what is the investment profile? Or what does the risk return profile look like? Because many organizations sit in the fast follower and laggard camp. And it's really important to say this is the kind of return you can expect and why it might be a challenge for somebody to get a higher, a, a, a bigger ROI. So with that, I think what I, what I will leave you with today right, is to say the real where we are right now in this space is very much about saying, it's about value capture. It's, there's, there's no shortage of use cases out there, right? There's hundreds, I think, across the lighthouses, across the 150 lighthouses, we've seen about 1,200 different use cases deployed across the board. There's about 200 we've seen deployed reliably across multiple sites, but there's no, sort, there's no shortage of ways to solve the problem. The, problem, the biggest problem that, that sits right now is to say, what is the right problem to solve? And how do I drive engagement and adoption of my end users to make sure that what I do sticks and that what, what I'm putting in, especially with AI and other tools right now, is what my end users are going to be excited to use. It's going to change the way they work. It's going to change the way they engage with their jobs day to day and drive that step change in engagement and that therefore that step change in performance. Thank you.